Hello, everybody. Welcome to this morning's webinar session. And we're just going to uh, go through some housekeeping here for just a moment while we a few other people come in and join us for today's session. Um, just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. And it's being recorded. So uh, in about a week or less or so, you'll be able to come and replay this and rewatch it along with there'll be a PDF download version of the material that we're going to be presenting here today. Um, so with that being said, looks like we're about at our start time. So why don't we get started here? And today our conversation is around the Chelsea T7 DPU storage application and use cases. And I am Greg Schultz from Server Storage IL and I'll be getting things started here. But joining me today is Bob Dugan from Chelsea. Oh, Bob, are you there? I think I I'm can here. see you. I, I'm here. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to work with you again, Greg, and to show off our product line. Just a quick correction is that we're not going to be just talking about T7, but also our T6 product line uh, as it relates to storage. So uh, that's exciting as well. So uh, looking forward to our discussion here. Absolutely, Bob, and I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, here in the tech world, we get so excited about what's new and what's coming and all the new stuff. We sometimes neglect about what you can do today, what's out there, and it's a fundamental building block. So as we go in through the day, we're certainly going to uh, be building more on that and expanding about the future, where things are going, but more importantly, what can be done today, tomorrow, um, and near term but also long term um so with that being said is let's get started here so we're going to be talking again as bob mentioned not just about the t7 but also the t6 and more importantly about the unified wire data processing units dpus we're yes we are going to throw some buzzwords and some tlas acronyms uh maybe even a little bit of buzzword bingo mixed in here somewhere just for fun but the whole point here it's about accelerating a variety of different applications different workloads spanning server storage io um, along with security protocols supporting a wide range of different aspects from the core to the edge uh cloud on-prem hybrid um and so forth so anyway uh brief introductions as i mentioned i am greg schultz uh founder independent industry analyst author consult consultant of uh server storage io storage io for short and uh also joining me is bob dugan director of engineering at chelsea communications so what we're going to do here here's the flow is i'm going to go through some big picture uh trends uh setting the stage and then i'm going to hand off to bob where he's going to give us some perspectives and a presentation around Chelsea, the T6, moving to the T7, what it all means, how to leverage it as a resource for optimization, uh, improving efficiency, but also effectiveness, i.e. productivity, performance, things like that. We are going to have a uh, open it up for discussions. And uh, with that, let's just get underway here. All right. So as I do my... Oh, I love technology. There we go. Okay, so what's the big picture? Surprise, surprise. Um, budget and any constraints are at odds with demand growth. You know, every year I say this is going to be more and more growth. Well, if one thing, there's going to be growth. There's no such thing as an information or data recession. There's always going to be more data, more information, more demand. Yes, we're going to optimize it. And that's part of our theme here is how to do more with what you have, how to do more with what you uh, have available. Um, but we're just seeing more and more of it across all different sectors, all different focus area. You know, another big picture is that something to re keep in mind is this fundamental premise. Hardware needs software. Software needs hardware. And in my opinion, the next truly, really true revolutionary technology will be software that does not require any hardware anywhere, any place, any time. And vice versa. But the meanwhile, the real key aspect is abstraction. 
abstracting the underlying complexity, abstracting the underlying resources for boosting productivity, boosting uh, the work that gets to be done. So, and that's what we're seeing as a part of that is that the different stacks, you know, from the low level to the upper levels, they're becoming more robust, but they're becoming more complex, requiring more compute cycles, more IO cycles, more memory, all these things that are abstracted, which means more need for CPUs as well as, um, you know, uh, generic as well as ARMs, but also offloads, things like GPUs, graphical processing units, DPUs, uh, data processing units, uh, storage processing units, um, all different variations. And combined with that, we're seeing also packaging improvements, smaller footprints, more processing capacity, memory, storage, I.O., uh, with less overhead, lower latency in a given density. But that also means we're having to support those stacks which are getting larger and heavier. Um, so that's part of that balancing act, part of that need to become not just more efficient, not just drive up utilization, but also effective which is about productivity, about reducing latency, reducing response time, um, while we increase that velocity, how fast things are happening. All right, so with that in mind, here's just some eye candy. Where the demand drivers and technology um, demands are coming, but also the capabilities. And that we see over there on that left, some demand drivers, different app use cases. You know, we hear a lot about data growth, but there's also the application growth. I mean, if you all you have is data, that's good, but you need the apps to transform the data into information, which is that useful capability. So the faster we can run those apps, the faster we can get more of that data, we increase that velocity of which information is available uh, for consumption. Um, improved pace. I'll use this acronym in different places, but it's a real simple acronym. Pace equals performance, availability, capacity, economics, including security, energy, effect effectiveness, and management. Okay. It's not paces in a picante sauce. It is a fundamental attribute. All applications, all workload have some attribute characteristics. Some are high performance, some are low, some need more capacity, but they all have some attribute. And then things are being deployed in different locations. And of course, budget and cost concerns. Over there on the right, we have the different technology evolutions that are occurring. If you want to substitute the word revolution, go for it. But we have the different architectures, the server storage, IO protocols, uh, packaging, um, as well as functionality enhancements. Functionality including offload, security, encryption, uh, RAID and parity, data footprint reduction, compression, compaction, dedupe, all those other uh, nice capabilities. So here's the thing, all applications and workloads have different resource needs that fall into performance, fall into availability, fall into capacity, and then also fall into the, uh, the economics. Um, and that includes performance, not just from an IOPS, but also from a throughput bandwidth, but also latency and rework, um, response time. So it's not just about all about IOPS, it's also about bandwidth and that latency. Uh, availability, data protection, backup, restore, resiliency copies, capacity, memory available, CPU available, um, what's the overhead, um, as well as different economic aspects to um, the equation here. Okay, so as I mentioned, demand drivers, there is no such thing as an information or data recession. There's going to be more demand. That's simple. Um, easy way to look at this is you look at whether it's a, a webinar like this or a photograph, they're getting bigger. You know, as we went from 1K to 2K to 4K to 8K to 10K, et cetera, the images are getting bigger. You know, we're talking about big data, the amount of telemetry, uh, the amount of data that's coming in from different sources, whether it be for IoT data coming in, command control going out, information that's being put into uh, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms to teach them how to do things like that, the video security analytics. In other words, that need for speed, that need for space and savings and at different locations. So as I mentioned, 
um, we're balancing all these different demands, which is getting to what we're here to talk about today is we've got the different solutions, the different technology, on-prem, public, private, hybrid, cloud, at the core, at the edge, whether it be software-defined, converged infrastructure, hyper-converged, aggregated, disaggregated, uh, cloud-native, take your pick, underlying enabling technologies, PCIe, Ethernet, NVMe, NVMe over fabrics, starting to play a little bit of buzzword bang, I think. Um, but the different form factors, um, and again, all those different attributes, those different capabilities. So we've got these different things, demands coming in, the enabling technologies, and what are we going to do about that? Well, let's start to drill down here so we can set Bob up for his conversation, which is that as we look at this picture here, it's showing a big picture. There's a lot going on here. Um, we basically, in this picture, have summarized, well, probably what could be an entire webinar, um, book, uh, lots of other things here. But at the heart of all this is that when we think about storage, when we think about servers, um, it's th that capability storage is packaged in many, many different ways. And a common theme is the IO. How are you going to move the data from the client to the storage server, from the storage server to its back end? Um, and a common theme is if we boil everything down, uh, the block protocols, file, object, streaming, tables, things like that, it's all over in that lower right corner, which is the server storage IO interfaces, the mediums, the different network types, the different protocols optimized for doing different types of work, for supporting different personalities of storage that do different things. Everything's not the same. Um, so hence, we've got these different options here. So if we drill in on this a little bit, yeah, we just went from really high level. We're dropping down in the stack here pretty quickly. And it sets up with where we're going, which is that, which is that at the heart of everything here, you know, we've got the servers and it's processing main me main memory, uh, main processing capability, different offloads, different types of processors, things like that. But we also have different communications, different IO networks, some for general purpose networking, some for storage specific, some more legacy, some more emerging. And what we're seeing here is a couple of trends, a couple of big trends, um, including that we're shifting from some of the legacy uh, server storage I.O. interfaces, you know, um, SATA, USB, um, InfiniBand, SAS, Fiber Channel, FCP, um, you know, even iSCSI. We're seeing those gravitating towards the NVMe command set. You know, we're seeing the growth, the continued growth and proliferation of Ethernet as a lower level uh, networking interface, whether it be cable or optic or Wi-Fi, whatever it happens to be. But we're seeing more and more gravitating towards that. So the, a couple of things here that are happening is that NVMe as a command set, similar to how SCSI as command set in the past ran on different transports, InfiniBand, uh, serial attached SCSI, fiber channel, Ethernet, IP, iSCSI, et cetera. NVMe is now taking over more and more of those workloads with the ability to run on PCIe, with the ability to run on IP, with the ability to run on un different underlying transports, and also both local direct attach, but also in a shared sort of environment and even over uh, longer distances. All right. So what that means is, if I can press my advanced key here, there we go, is that we've got the client up there on the upper left, and that client could mean different things. It could be the actual end user. It could be on the top left, top center, a client um, uh application that's communicating with a database server or maybe a storage server or something else. But we've got these different layers, different types of clients, hence context comes into play, different initiators talking to some sort of target server um, that might be a storage server, it might be an app server, um, but again, ultimately talking to the storage or talking to a storage service somewhere. So what we have there is the notions of the front end connectivity, the back end connectivity, uh, the different storage media mediums, 
um, i.e. solid state, flash, traditional rotating disk, et cetera, with their different packaging and interfaces. The common theme across all these is whether regardless of the packaging, the front end, the back end, the initiators is those IO networks, that capability. So we're seeing more work being having to be done to move the data, whether it's north, south, up and down from a client to a server, whether it's east, west, across a control plane, east, west, between uh, nodes within a cluster. That common theme is there's more work to be done on those interfaces. And in a software-defined world, that means software stacks, network stacks, storage stacks are running on general purpose processors. Hence, to relieve those processors, those servers, so they can do more useful work, hence the need for offload capabilities. We see that with graphic processing units, GPUs. Uh, we've seen that with iSCSI offloads and others. And as we look forward, there's gonna be some looking towards the past. How can we leverage these similar capabilities on a go forward basis? So with that in mind, let's go forward and let's bring Bob in from Chelsea to talk about uh, where we're at today, where we've been, where we're at today, but also where we're going forward. Bob? Yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, one thing that struck me going through those slides that you just did is that those client servers targets are all interconnected via the network massive amounts of data traveling over that network and each of those endpoints has to handle that data in a quick efficient way and that's exactly where chelsea comes into play so let me uh share my screen here yeah and, and while you're doing that bob that you bring up a good point while you're bringing the uh, uh your screen share up is that, you know, a lot of conversations about, you know, big data, more data. And we have to keep in perspective that there's the volume of data, i.e. how much of it and how big is it. But we also keep in mind the velocity. So there's this data which is getting bigger and there's more of it, but it's also coming at us. We're having to need it to get it at a faster rate, at a faster velocity. Yeah, and we we don't see the need for that velocity acceleration declining. It's increasing, actually. And exactly. the amount of data is just keeps going up year after year after year. And, you know, I've seen statistics where it's just incredible the amount of data growth in the last 10 years. You're talking order of magnitude bigger, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so, okay, so... Uh, Personal reminder is at the end of this uh, of my slide deck, we're going to do a Q&A and I remind people that they can go ahead and type in their questions in the, in the chat box, the Zoom chat box, and our moderator will, uh, behind the scenes, will pass those off to Greg and not myself so we can answer those. Okay, so with that, let me talk a little bit um, about my deck here. Uh, we we have five topics that we want to cover here. First, company overview. So uh, Chelsea has been around for 20 years. So I'll, I'll be talking about uh, the company, the big company that no one's heard of, <laughs> so to speak. We, we are well known, but not like some of the other big, uh, big guys, but we actually punch above our weight. And I'll go into that a bit. I'll talk about our currently shipping product, T6, maybe a little bit about T5 as well, uh, our, which is a, basically a smart NIC. Uh, and I'll go into some performance benchmarks with that T6. Uh, and today I'll be focusing on storage in particular. So, uh, and then I'll go into T7. T7 is our upcoming product this year. Uh, it's a DPU or also uh, a version of it. it can be a smart NIC as well. And I'll talk about some details of that. I, I know a lot of people are curious about it. So I'll, I'll give a flavor of what to what's coming. And then, as I mentioned, the Q&A at the end. So let me get right into it. Chelsea has been around, as I said, 20 plus years. I would say I've been there 21 years. So uh, yeah, it's been probably 22, 23 years now. Uh, we are, uh, we've been 
shipping to very big customers for a long time. Uh, thus, we have millions of ports shipped at this point. Uh, we specialize in offload. So as Greg was mentioning, we we want to uh, relieve that data pressure on the on those endpoints, the clients, the servers, the targets, et cetera. And we do that by taking the stacks off of the software stack, typically built into the operating system. And we, we siliconize them. We put them into silicon, into RTL, and put them into our chip, into our ASIC. And it's remarkable what we can do with that. And we've been doing this from the very beginning, 20 plus years ago. Uh, it's a feature rich, scalable solution. Uh, and the markets we play in is typically in the data centers and in storage. So north of 50% of our business is in storage. So that's one of the reasons we're focusing on storage here. But it's front and center, top, storage. So you, as you can see, those markets are uh, not just in storage. We, we also have networking, virtualization. Uh, we are big in media streaming. So a lot of the big names that you uh, sit home at night and watch uh, your favorite shows with are streaming through Chelsea O'Nix. Um, we, we play in high-frequency trading, HPC, and... Uh, in the bottom right, we, we show encryption, and we could do almost all of these protocols encrypted in line without losing performance. So that's a, a key factor. So it's very exciting for our customers that they can secure their data as it goes over the wire. So let me now go into our currently shipping, our T6. Here's a high-level block diagram of the chip itself. Uh, as you can see on the far right, we have two ports, Ethernet ports. They go from 1 gig, 10 gig, 25 gig, 40 gig, 50, and 100 gig. And then on the far left, we have PCIe by 16 Gen 3. So this enables you to get 100 gig throughput through this chip. Uh, the, the heart of this chip is the data flow protocol engine. And inside that is our tow engine, our TCP IP offload engine. That enables us to efficiently offload storage protocols such as iSCSI and, uh, and iWARP, which is an RDMA protocol, uh, which you know, some people use ICER with iWARP or, NV or NFS over tow. And they can get highly efficient storage flows through this chip. One thing that you should know about our architecture from T1 all the way through T6 and continuing on with T7 is that as a packet comes in, say, off the wire, it goes through the chip to the PCI bus in a deterministic amount of time. This is a, this is a uh, single processor data flow pipeline architecture. So uh, it's a deterministic amount of clock cycles to get it through. Uh, some of our competitors use a lot of of small processors to to work on the packets. We don't do that. So this is how we get our performance. Whereas some of the other guys, they just can't keep up when, the, especially when the uh, when the connection count rises. We can offload tens, ten, twenty thousand connections with this chip, and the latency through this chip is deterministic. Another interesting part of this is that we have models with an, uh, with on chip RAM, and uh, if you need more, such as with the iSCSI protocol, we can we we put chips DDRs on the adapter itself, and we can consolidate the traffic, the data before we DMA it to the host, or vice versa. Uh, this is smart NIC, so it has standard things, look up with filtering and firewall as a traffic manager for QoS. Uh, this chip has TLS and SSL and IPsec coprocessor, so you can either inline or as a coprocessor offload and encrypt your data. 
Uh, and we have a general purpose processor, but it's used internally for uh, maintaining this, but it does not maintain the, or, or uh, managing the flow, but it doesn't touch the data. So this has, so it's still a deterministic way through. Um, and in our t upcoming T7, which I'll get into, we have other ARM processors and I'll get into that, which makes it a DPU. So let me move on here. Uh, we have a very rich software offering. As you can see, Linux, Windows, FreeBSD, uh, Illumos, VMware ESX, and uh, we even do Mac OS. Uh, this T6 software is the same as on T5, so the same driver works on T5 or T6, and on T7, our driver that comes out for T7 will also work with T6 and T5. So this is carrying the the, the software investment that Chelsea has made forward. Uh, and in fact, we have just as many, if not more software engineers working at Chelsea as hardware engineers. It's a huge investment and a huge lift. And our architecture was built correctly from the very beginning, which then makes it uh, easier for us to forward, to move forward with the software offering without too much incremental changes. So this is how we're able to, to keep going. Um, we, you know, the, the idea here is that the architecture was solid from day one, and that was 20 plus years ago, and we continue with that. All right, I, I want to get into some benchmarks. Uh, I'll do some, I'll, I'll show some iSCSI benchmarks, and then I'll show some NVMe over fabrics, NVMe over TCP benchmarks. Uh, first, the iSCSI benchmark, just one slide. This is a paper we uh, did with DeMartech, now Principal Technology. Uh, the setup is on top. And what this illustrates are some of the IOPS uh, benefit from doing offload as well as the CPU utilization reduction. So the CPU utilization diff, uh, reduction is 18% for 4K writes, reads and for 4K writes it's almost 50%, but that's with an increase of load, 200% on the reads and 43% on the writes. So you're getting more work done with less CPU. Uh, I, Chelsea has shined in iSCSI. We, we we very much dominate this market and we do it very efficiently, as you can see. All right, let me move on to now NVMe over TCP and NVMe over Fabrics. We partnered with Fadu, uh, who is an NVMe uh, supplier, and we did some benchmarks and uh, some surprising and interesting and good results came out of it. Here's the, the setup, the test configuration. We have one target connected to four client machines. You could read about the details here. As was mentioned earlier, we will be publishing this uh, information in about a week's time, this slide deck, and also the paper is available here. These are all connected via 100 gig through a switch, and uh, we, we are using uh, Fadu uh, NVMe drives, and the model is here. And this is running two Intel Xeon without hyper-threading, this much RAM running RHEL, and our T6 2100 CR adapter. Uh, that's throughout that same adapter. Right into the numbers here. So this slide shows, with that setup, the bandwidth. So you can basically see that this is running at line rate, no matter what your IO size, 8K, 64K, 256K. And on the left here, you can see which which are the protocols that we're, we're running here. Um, NVMe over TCP, this is through the Chelsea NIC, but only the software stack uh, as it ships with, with uh, Linux. With uh, NVMe over TCP offload, the numbers there, SBDK, which is user space NVMe over TCP offload. Uh, and we also do RDMA with NVMe over fabrics, both kernel space and SBDK user space. 
And as you can see, the, as I said, the numbers are pretty much line rate across the board. So the, the advantage isn't really there for NVMe over TCB software versus offload. But this is where it gets interesting on these next few slides. Look at the CPU utilization. This is CPU utilization per gigabit per second. <clears throat> so for NVMe over TCP software stack, we're getting an efficiency of 0.46. Now, when we offload it with the kernel base, we're getting 0.34. So this is a quite, a, quite a difference. That's at least 25% improvement uh, for, um, and that's for the 8K IO size. For a 64K IO size, it's less pronounced. As the IO sizes get larger, that's to be expected. You look at the SPDK, both, the NVMe over TCP and the NVMe over fabrics with RDMA and with iWARP. This is expected to be, we're using one quarter of the CPU because it's polling. This is polling and user space, so that's expected as well. And then when you just do without the um, SBDK, without the user space with iWARP RDMA, you, you also get some fantastic numbers. Uh, let me show you now the IOPS numbers. So the IOPS numbers for, so we're just showing it for NVMe over TCP here. And the, the software stack gives, this is in millions of IOPS. So it gives you about 0.1 improvement if you're offloading NVMe over TCP. And if you're using user space, which SPDK is known for is to improve latency and, and IOPS, it's getting 2.871. So not much different than the kernel space. So there is a there is a bit of a difference, a, an increase and uh, another advantage. It's incremental, but it's, it's pretty good. The very interesting one now is on latency. So what I'm showing here are latency numbers between local and remote. And this is actually a delta, right? So Oops, sorry. Uh, this is a delta between the local and over the network. Uh, so it's not the absolute number of latency. Uh, so NVMe over TCP gives a delta of about 27 microseconds. Uh, and this is for reads. Uh, the overall read number is somewhere around 63, something like that for the local, and add 27 for the remote. For NVMe over TCP with offload, we have an improvement of a couple microseconds. SBTK becomes even more interesting where we're getting down to 21 microsecond delta. Uh, and RDMA really shines here, 13, and with user space, 12. So that's that's like half or more than half of the delta latency. That's basically like it's 13 microseconds is, is very, very low. And it acts pretty much like it's local on the machine, but in fact is remote. Now, how does this look from the big point of big picture point of view for each of these? So I'll, I'll show throughput latency advantage, CPU utilization advantage, and I give a comment for each of these. For NVMe over TCP, all the way down is line rate throughput. So not a big advantage there, but look at the latency advantage. It's up to 66 percent up to 6% uh, improvement between local and remote. So that's a 6%, but with offload, you're getting 20% with, with SBDK. NVMe over fabrics, close to 50%, and with SBDK, NVMe over fabrics with RDMA, 55%. CPU utilization, even better story. So we're talking, a 26% CPU advantage versus 41% or so. So it's averaging around 40% here. Some comments, the NVMe over TCP offload, the initiator and target can both be offloaded or because this is NVMe over TCP. So you can have the initiator say, be the software stack and the target being 
the offload section, or being offloaded with NVMe over TCP, SBDK, CPU utilization uh, is, is very good, but as you get into larger IOs, it's it's a race. So uh, this is like for smaller IOs, like 8K, you're getting a fantastic. So that's like using this with databases, which are typically somewhere around 8K IO sizes, usually smaller transactions. NVMe over, T, or over fabrics using RDMA, uh, this requires an RNIC, an RDMA NIC on both ends, um, uh, both the initiator and the target, although there is a highly efficient iWARP software initiator. So the numbers are actually very surprisingly good compared to the Rocky V2 software initiator. So that's also something that you guys can keep in mind. And with SPDK offload, uh, the CPU utilization, uh, yeah, it's also great on the smaller I.O. sizes. Here's a summary. We deliver line rate throughout. We reach 2.9 million IOPS of 4K I.O. sizes. This is fantastic. This is using one server. This is off of one server. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it provides local like access to remote storage, which is the goal really, because you you want to scale and the way to scale is you can't have all your storage local. So this is one great and, and centrally managed. And you can provide significant CPU savings um, compared to the non-offloaded non NVMe over TCP and NVMe over fabrics. Um, so the, the overall story with offload is fantastic. You you can get these great advantages. And the other thing is that you can then also, uh, with these lower CPU utilizations, you can also downgrade the server, the client, or, or even the target CPU from a, a very high-end, say, Xeon down to a, a mid-tier. You could save hundreds, if not thousands of dollars by using offload using a Chelsea Steel adapter. Okay, so let me get into T7 now. Uh, this is our next generation product coming out this year. And uh, I start with the block, block diagram. If you remember, T6 had two ports. This has four ports. This is a little confusing. Uh, there's four ports of 10, 25, 50, or 100 gig with this chip and the adapters. Or you can have two ports of 40 or 200 gig, two ports. Or you can have one port of 400 gig. So this is a 400 gig device. Uh, this is supported by a PCIe Gen 5 by 16 endpoint. And uh, this PCI Gen 5 interface can either be an endpoint or a root complex or both. And I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, this is a smart, this is a, a DPU. So thus we have some ARM A72 processors built in. There are, depending on the model, there are up to eight of these. And those are fully uh, for use by the customer. And we have, we have a, a SB, uh, uh, SDK for the customer to use and to program this. Off of this chip, we can also hang, I'll show this in a in another slide, but we can hang NVMe devices up uh, off of this chip. So we can have up to eight NVMe devices, uh, eight by twos, and this can connect then just to Ethernet and be operating without uh without a Xeon connect uh, in, in a server. So it could be an endpoint in itself. This has all the goodness of the previous six generations of ASIC. So we, of course, have our protocol processor, Dataflow protocol engine uh, that's carry forward. On this chip, we're adding some protocols. Each, each generation, we added protocols what this chip does is we add NVMe over TCP, offloading the full stack on the chip. 
we also are adding Rocky V2. So these are the two main protocols that we're adding. The encryption, we're adding uh, encryption for the payload for all of the protocols. So just we can offload just the, the payload. Um, and we have a built-in PCIe Gen 4 switch. We have other memories, USB and EMMC. Uh, we can connect to this chip an FPGA. So you can have data come in, steer it out to the FPGA. You can do your custom work, deep packet inspection or modification, and then back in and then out to the out to the PCI bus or back out the Ethernet port. This is all configurable and uh, you can steer the, the traffic as you as you like. This has the risk cores as before. We've added more. Uh, in T6 is only one core. This is for Chelsea use. Um, so this is to handle the management of the higher throughput of 400 gig. Uh, again, this has tens of thousands of connections capable. Um, we have the lookup filtering firewall engine. Um, we're also adding compression and dedupe to this chip for the storage side. So uh, from a storage point of view, this has a lot of interesting and useful uh, offloads that you can take advantage of. There's also a version called the S7. This is more of a smart NIC. We took out the ARM cores on this so that it place in the, it's basically a, a replacement for T6, but it can give you a two by 200 gig on this or, or four by 100 gig. So whereas T6 was two port, this is four ports. So this improves that. And it also adds those same protocols I mentioned before, Rocky V2 and VME over TCP uh, full offload. It has the coprocessors of encryption in it and so on and so this is really designed to be a lower cost play so highly affordable t6 drop in a replacement chip and i promised to show you some applications with t6 or t7 uh the traditional interface of the Lower right, figure five, is what I just talked about, the S7 Ethernet with a, plugged into a horse host. This is, the, the green block is really, you know, a, an HPA or a card that plugs into the host. But there's some other interesting things, such as I talked on T7, where you can have up to eight NVMe devices plugged into T7 and then off to an Ethernet wire. So there's no host involved here. This is kind of a JBOF application. And you can offload all these protocols here, NVMe over Fabrics or NVMe over TCP. NVMe over Fabrics will include iWARP as well, but but of course the added Rocky V2, which is uh, you know popular. There's an INIC application. This is what I talked about where you can use it with an FPGA. You can have a generalized bridge as shown, and you can even have an NVMe over to NVMe bridge where you have NVMe bus over to an SSD. So this not being an NVMe, it's just a pure SSD. So this becomes an NVMe bridge. Okay, so I've gone through it. Uh, we do have some next steps call to action for you guys. What we would like to do is post this in about a week's time. This says 122. It might be a bit sooner than this. Both the uh, both to this website, both the this presentation as well as the PDF to the the white papers that we show showed in the benchmarks. Uh, we would like to, for you guys listening today, there is a special for T6. So if you, when you order, you say Chelsea Smart, uh, email us and we'll give you a significant uh, discount. And finally, you can explore the T7 DPU capabilities in depth. We can do a deep, deeper dive 
So you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one call by emailing us here. And with that, uh, Greg, I think we're we're wrapped up with the with the presentations. Now we're in the Q and A and general discussion phase here. Yep. So um, do you have any comments, Greg? To yeah. So to a couple of things. Said? Yeah. Great. Outstanding, Bob. So we got a couple of uh, questions that. Um, have come in and I've got some that uh, I'd like to add to the queue as well. But one of them is, is Chelsea technology needed to be on both the target as well as the initiator to realize the benefits you've been talking about? Yeah, I, I think I touched on that. Uh, when you're talking about specifically storage, uh, there are several storage protocols, uh, NFS, for instance, you can have offload on one side, but not the other. iSCSI, same thing. These are meant to be software or hardware-based protocols. So uh, those for sure, NVMe over TCP, same thing, exactly the same thing, where you can have the target, say, being offloaded, <laughs> where you have hundreds, even thousands of connections coming in where you really do need those offloads. Whereas on the initiator, maybe you have a lighter load and you can just use a general purpose NIC and use the software stack on that side. Uh, NVMe over fabrics is tougher uh, because that's RDMA based. I, I mentioned that there is iWarp based software solutions as well as Rocky V2. iWarp's a better choice because it's higher performing than the Rocky V2, but it, that is available as well. So uh, just from the storage point of view, yes, these are all viable options to have one side offloaded, the other side not. Okay, great. You know, Bob, you mentioned deterministic. I love that. Um, is that, you know, when we're talking about server storage IO, you know, there really is that need for deterministic, um, especially as you move from local direct attach to local shared or what's sometimes called remote and, and different aspects to it. But what caught my eye is that, you know, your comment and it shows up in the numbers is that as you're increasing that volume, that activity, you know, and, and that velocity that your technology is keeping up with it, which sounds like you've got all the software capability, but that it's not software bloat, that it's lightweight, you know, to keep that deterministic um, approach. Yeah, you know, I've heard this joke, well, real men do silicon, you know, and <laughs> uh, to do it, to keep up, we have this architecture where the actual protocol is in the RTL itself. It's not in processors, not in lots of little processors in the silicon, but actually in the RTL, the algorithms, the, you know, how, how we handle the data is all done uh baked into the chip itself. It's not an FPGA either. It's not an FPGA solution. FPGAs are great for prototyping and getting things done in a quick way. But if you want real speed, real performance, you have to actually invest the time and effort and the technology uh, in putting it into the RTL. Uh, if you go, come over to Chelsea in Sunnyvale, California, you'll see a wall of patents. There's just you know, dozens of them, all related to this offload, doing it in silicon. So uh, that's our secret sauce. And that's how we are able to, you know, get this performance. And that's why these big OEM companies repeatedly come back to Chelsea and, and choose us. So uh, there's a reason for it because of the technology. And Bob, you mentioned something there, which is another uh, thing to key off of is that, you know, one of the one of the uh, focuses have been, you know what, these specialized adapters, these offloads, they're so expensive, whether they're fiber channel or InfiniBand or Ether, you know, et cetera. Let's just go run on low cost general purpose processors with a software stack, but it's not looking at the complete ROI, that complete cost of ownership. And you mentioned something there, you know, not to beat up on FPGAs, but yeah, they're great for prototyping, great for things that are changing a lot or low volume where you're optimized for that more robust um, preserving the past, leveraging the future. 
but that you can also achieve some economies of scale, which help to make things. Because you mentioned about that cost of ownership, um, being able to do more in a cost-effective way. Yeah, that's right. Uh, part of the cost, a lot of people overlook, but it's super important is after you buy, after you install the this equipment in your data center, there's this thing called power, right? And with Chelsea, with our T6, we're, we're, all of these are under 25 watts. And with T7, full blown with all the ARM processors enabled, running full bore, we're, we're still in excellent shape, 50, 60 watts total. Our competitive, uh, if you look at the competitive out, um, um, landscape, you'll see that our competitors are 75 at the very minimum with the minimum amount of DPU power up to, you know, the more powerful ones, they're, they're north of 150, 200 watts. So that adds up at scale, right? That power is, uh, is money. And uh, because we're doing all of these protocols in silicon, it's highly efficient uh, from the power point of view. Uh, and the other advantage, of course, with doing it in silicon is that you can manufacture this at scale and uh, and keep the cost low. So that's what we've done. And, and Bob, there's a key point in there and that some people will say, well, here, we're going to we're going to measure things on a IOP per watt basis, which is an improvement. But you have to also look at it more holistically is, you know, what's that IOP per watt or that IOP per, per bandwidth? um cost per bandwidth of um a cubic foot or a cubic meter in other words look at it more holistically is that if you need to get two point whatever million iops what's your footprint not just your carbon footprint your emissions or your energy draw how much space does that take how many servers does that take as opposed to being able to do more of that work in a smaller footprint um, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's 2.5 million um, IOPS per <laughs> watt per cubic foot, whatever, that starts to look at things in a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we have this great power story, but you also look at the physical sizes of our adapters. They're almost all of them are half height, half length. So they fit into like a 1U server and all the way up. But physically, you can do you can you can um, pack the amount of bandwidth through these adapters in a small space. The other thing is with because they do draw less power. There's also the cooling aspect. Uh, you know, I was recently at the supercomputing show in Dallas, Texas, and they're you know with GPUs are a big power draw, so they're dipping the whole things in in liquid and doing liquid cooling, and it's like man, that's pretty crazy. But if you're not doing and, and the power draw is huge, but if you're doing like pure um, storage or networking, there's no need for liquid. There's no need to <clears throat> super cool these with, you know, 500 LFM or whatever. Our requirement is is 200 LFM air cooled. There's no liquid cooling involved. So, um, you know, small size, low power, cooling costs are low. Uh, so. Yeah, so I, doing it as again back into the putting everything into the RTL itself is the key design decision that we made from the very beginning as paying dividends now. And it's probably stayed in the obvious to kind of like put a, a nice ribbon around all that is that you mentioned a one U, but it could be two U, whatever that form factor is. The real power, or the real capability there is that that app, that workload, that whatever it happens to be that that adapter is attached to, that server platform may not have to be upgraded as soon as it would if you're not doing what you're doing. In other words, you allow that platform to do more work by offloading some of it, which has even more impacts upstream, software licensing, other things. Um, mm -hmm. Bob, it looks like we got to start wrapping up here. Um, you mentioned T7, all the great things that you've been able to do with T6 going backwards. Let's go forward. Is T7 available today? 
Well, T7 is available as an emulation platform right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so that's uh, in the lab and available to select customers where they can test their software and uh, on that platform. That will be coming out sometime this year, I, I suspect like somewhere mid-year and uh, with real silicon and we'll be ready to rock and roll with it. Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement around it. Uh, customers are lining up um, waiting for this. So uh, the reason is that it's a, it's a DPU, but done right. And people are very excited about it. Outstanding. Outstanding. So just a reminder to all of our attendees, we have to wrap up here. If you've got follow-up questions, we've got some contact information there for myself, Greg Schultz at Storage IO, also at Unlimited IO, as well as Bob Dugan from Chelsea. Um, Bob, looks like we've got to wrap up. Any closing thoughts, closing comments, tips? You mentioned some good call to action resources. Yeah, I I would say that uh, take a look at Chelsea because uh, you know, we're not the, the big name, but we have the big solution and uh, the right solution. So uh, it's just as simple as that. Uh, and we deliver and as evident by the large OEMs that we sell to uh, that keep coming back to us. So uh, it's the right solution at the right time. Outstanding. Outstanding. So with that, we're going to wrap up here. Just a reminder to everybody, this has been recorded and you can go to the Chelsea website and um, I think probably be within the next week, this will be available um, that you can watch it, replay it, share it with others, as well as there'll be a PDF version of the um, material that has been presented there today. So um, on behalf of myself, Greg Schultz, some uh, service storage IO, as well as Bob Dugan from Chelsea. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Look forward to chatting with you all very soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.